Hello, this is Martina and welcome to week two of our online academy. Today we're going to talk about the goals of seating and the effective forces at work on the body and the principles of seating. We hope you enjoyed last week's seminar. These seminars are accumulation of 30 years experience and research into clinical seating. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them below. And if you have any suggestions for future seminars, please let us know. So last week we had a message or a question from Amanda who works with NHS. And her question was, how do you accommodate hamstrings in a chair if someone has tight hamstrings? And as you can see from this diagram, the hamstrings go over the hip joint and over the knee joint. So when you're assessing someone, you, if the person has tight hamstrings, you need to adjust the leg rest to accommodate the hamstrings. So the leg rest needs to be adjusted. You can see in this video here that the leg rest is going into a negative angle. So the heels are being loaded behind the knee to accommodate the tight hamstrings. And this is vitally important. The other important point is you need to open up the back angle. Because the, ha the hamstrings are over the hip and the knee joint, you need to accommodate them both at the hip and at the knee. So what is good posture and why is it important? By approximately 10 months of age, a child will develop a very good sitting posture. The child will sit with a spine and head in midline. The head is balanced securely over the body and the hands and the feet are free to interact with the environment. And this is a very efficient posture and requires the least amount of effort to maintain that. So the little child can sit in a nice upright position and the child can play can reach out for a toy, bring it back to midline and not fall over. But a lot of the clients that we're dealing with on a regular basis have lost this ability. So what prevents us from maintaining this upright posture? So what do you think the answer is? What prevents us from maintaining this upright posture? Well, the answer is gravity. Gravity is working against us all the time. And if we have lost our ability to hold ourselves upright, upright against gravity, well then we've lost our postural control. So what happens to our body when we lose postural control? And the, this is a photograph of a lady in a care home. And as you can see, she has fallen to one side. She's no longer able to hold herself upright against gravity. Uh, and she, her weight is all going through one side of her body. Now I'm going to show you a series of photographs and you can see from these photographs that these clients have all lost the ability to hold themselves upright against gravity. And what effect is this having on the body? So when, when someone is unable to hold themselves upright against gravity, there is forces at work on the body. And these forces are destructive and they're damaging the body. And the forces are tension, compression, shear, friction, bending, and torque. And what are the effect of these forces on the body? The body will buckle and bend underneath these forces. And the goal of sitting, one of the main goals of sitting, is to reduce these forces at work on the body. And we're going to go into some detail about how we reduce these forces at work on the body in this particular webinar. So sitting is not a static activity. Sitting is very unstable and the body segments will buckle and bend under the pull of gravity. So our muscles provide us with the greatest form of stability. But when the muscles are no longer functioning because of neurological impairment or an illness or a condition, well then we have to use external supports and they are a substitute when muscles are no longer working. So seating becomes a substitute when the muscles are no longer able to stabilize the body. And there'll always be a compromise between support and function. If you over support a body, you can reduce the function. So it's getting the balance right. So stability is the answer. Stability reduces the effect of forces on the body. So our main goal of sitting is to stabilize the body. The stability of the body will, will reduce the sliding, will reduce the forces at work on the body. So how do we stabilize the body? We stabilize the body by lowering the center of gravity and by giving the client a wide base of support. And the other thing we need to do is we need to make sure that the body is loaded. So stability 
is by lowering the centre of gravity and increasing the base of support and stability will reduce the forces at work on the body. So the main cornerstone for seating is the pelvis. And I'm just going to show you a little diagram of the pelvis or a little uh, image of the pelvis here because we had a question from Claire in Lancashire from last week and she just wanted a re review or a recap on the actual pelvis itself. So this is the pelvis and here we have the iliac spine, the iliac crest. And at the very front of the iliac crest, we have two little notches. And these little notches are called the ASIS. And this is what Claire wanted me to be more specific about. So the ASIS are at the front of the iliac crest, the iliac spine. And at the back, the little notches at the back are called the PSIS, right? So in normal setting where we looked at the child, the ASIS are level. If the client falls to the side, this is called an obliquity. And you notice an obliquity because one ASIS is lower than the other. And you can see in this case, the weight then is being transferred onto one IT. And the IT is the ischial tuberosities. They're the two bony prominences that you sit on when, when you sit on a chair. And in good setting or proper seating, the weight should be taken evenly through both ITs. But when the pelvis is tilted to the side, well then the weight is going through one IT. So that's an obliquity. A rotation is when the pelvis is rotated like that. And you notice it because one ASIS is forward and one is back. And usually in a client, you see a leg length discrepancy. And just to finish off with the other two important postures, and one of the, the first one is, posterior pelvic tilt and that is where the pelvis is tilted back and the ASIS are higher than the PSIS. In normal setting the ASIS and the PSIS should be level. In a posterior pelvic tilt the ASIS are higher and what we're finding there then the weight is going through the sacrum and this is an area very prone to skin breakdown. And then the fourth one is the anterior tilt. And that is where the pelvis is tilted forward and the ASIS is lower than the PSIS. And in this case, the weight goes through the pubic region. And we talked last week about the damage to the pubic region and the effect it's having on the bladder. So we can recap on those. You can ask questions about this if you feel you want something clarified there. So just to talk then that the pelvis is the cornerstone for stability. If we can stabilise the pelvis when we put someone in a chair, because it influences the attitude of the body above and below it. So stabilising the pelvis is key for good setting. Correct positioning of the pelvis is essential to build a stable base in sitting, standing or in lying. When we think of stability, we think proximal to distal. So for functional movement to occur in sitting, Stability of the proximal parts of the body is a prerequisite to distal control. For example, pelvic stability is required for the spine so that the head is free to move. The shoulder girdle is, is required to be stable in order to get um, movement at the hand and fine hand movement. And so during our research that we did, uh, we found that there was a notable improvement in function when the body was stabilised. So just to give you a visual on what is stability and stability is when we have a wide base of support and a low center of gravity. So if we look at these four diagrams, you can see that the second diagram there demonstrates a stable base of support and a low center of gravity. And we've designed our chairs around this and in particular one chair that really does lower the center of gravity. So if you have somebody who is sliding and you're having a problem with the forces and someone slipping and sliding off a chair, you know, you need to really consider lowering the center of gravity and increasing the base of support. So overall, we want to maximize the body contact with the seating surface. And that means get as much of the body in contact with the chair as possible. Because by doing this, we stabilize the body and we also spread the weight over a large surface area, therefore reducing interface pressure, which will reduce the damage to skin. 
So let's think about what are our goals for seating. If we're doing a seating assessment, what are we trying to achieve? And it's very important that you do have goals for seating, that you know what you want to achieve from the seat. So the seating goals can be divided into three areas. We have the functional or the activity related goals. We have the physiological functioning and the psychological functioning. And uh, I think seating should be looked at on the broad sense. It isn't just one or the other because the psychological impact is really, really important. I'm sure there are times that you've gone in to visit a client and they're sitting in a kythotic posture and they're looking at the floor. So that's they're looking at their feet most of the day. And think of the impact that that's having, not only on the physiological and their functional ability, but also psychologically, that they can't make eye contact, they can't see who's coming close to them, and they can't really communicate with someone uh, in their area. So the goals of sitting should really comprise the whole person. So let's think about what our primary goals would be. So we want to improve the ability to do functional tasks. We want to limit the adverse effects of muscle imbalance. So when we talked about the forces that work on the body, those forces are causing muscle, they're causing adverse effects on the muscle imbalance. So for example, we might have skin breakdown, there might be contractures. So we want to limit the effects of muscle imbalance, prevent skin breakdown. We want to facilitate digestion and respiration and to provide support that promotes good posture alignment. So when we looked at the child at the beginning, with the, hatch, the child was in a nice posture alignment. We're going to try as much as possible to try and get our clients into a good posture alignment. So we want to reduce fatigue and maximize comfort because actually sitting is very hard work, which is the reason why clients tend to not sit out for very long. And again, I want to talk to you in later webinars about research that we've done in numerous hospitals and, and care homes and what we found when the person was supported, when their body was loaded, when you could change their position, they actually increased the time they sat out in a chair. So in later webinars, we will go into this in more detail about how important it is to support the body and to increase the length of time a person sits out. So I'm going to finish this part with the four principles of pressure management. Uh, in a later webinar, I will actually go into this in much more detail. But I think it's important at the end of this just to recap on what is important, uh, the important principles of seating. So the first one is to load the body, to make sure as much of the body is in contact with the chair as possible. The second one is, is to provide postural support where necessary. And this is going to give good postural alignment. We need to allow effective repositioning so that the client can change or can be changed their position regular. And also then number four is using an appropriate surface or cushion. So these are what we call the four principles of pressure management or the four principles of seating. And later on, we will do a special webinar on these. So just to recap today, uh, the webinar was about the goals of setting, about the effect of forces that work on the body. And if you have any questions at all, please send them in to us and we'll try to cover them. We will answer your question right away, but we'll also cover them in future uh, webinars. So thank you very much for joining up and I hope you enjoyed the webinar.